Thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I want to take you on a journey about cardiac surgery training. Some of you may know that we've been training surgeons and, and doctors pretty much the same way for greater than 100 years. And it began around the 1900s by William Stuart Halstead. And he developed this technique of training people, which was essentially an apprenticeship model. That means that you would go to Dr. Halstead and spend five years, 10 years, 20 years, until he said, you're good enough to go. Now, we've come a long way since then. We have regulatory bodies. We have goals and objectives. But the base training paradigm remains the same. It's an apprenticeship model. It's a rite of passage. How many people in the room either have had cardiac surgery or know somebody that's had cardiac surgery? Well, my cardiac surgery training program lasted nearly 10 years. And I want to talk to you about how we got there. Early in my career, I was only a couple of years out of training, I had a patient, her name was Mary. And I was doing an open heart operation. I was inside of her heart, her heart was stopped, she was being kept alive by what we call the heart-lung machine. And about midway through the operation, the lights went out. That's something that I'd never been trained to take care of. And we'll come back to that. On January 15, 2009, US Airways Flight 1549 took off from New York's LaGuardia Airport. Several minutes after takeoff, it ran into a flock of Canadian geese and both engines shut down. In a feat of heroism, Captain Sullenberger, First Officer Skiles, landed that plane in the water. Now, as remarkable and inspirational of a story as that is, what really interests me from a training standpoint is what happened in the 90 seconds between engine shut shutdown and touchdown on the ground. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, it's a great one. You should watch it. But these two gentlemen, in those 90 seconds, went through a series of drills and checklists to try to restart the engines. Not once, which is the FAA mandate, but three times in 90 seconds. And in that time, they were steering a 183,000-pound glider down onto the water. Everybody lived. Everybody walked off the plane. When I trained in surgery, it was a series of immersion. Over the course of nearly 10 years, I observed, participated in, was supervised, doing thousands of operations. My faculty were close by. They were always part of the operation. But it was an apprenticeship. I got checked off every step along the way. Well, things have changed. In the good old days when I trained, it was quite common to work 120 or more hours per week. Just file that number away for a minute. 120 or more hours per week for nearly a decade. That's a lot of time. Around the turn of the century, at the beginning of the millennium, work hour restrictions entered into how we take care of, how we train our residents. And now, today, we're at about 80 hours per week maximum training. In Europe, actually, this has gotten more restrictive, and we're now down to 42 hours in Europe. Now, we have to couple this with what's going on in the world. In 1982, the futurist Buckminster Fuller described the accumulated increase in knowledge. And from the year zero to year 1500, he estimated that our knowledge doubled. But then it took another 250 years for it to double again, and another 150 years for it to double again. And in fact, at the year 2000, the estimate was that knowledge is doubling every two years. Today, the estimate is knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. So now we have to combine this 
decrease in work hours, exponential increase in knowledge, and you can imagine the plight of our residents. How are they going to cram all this in in a set amount of time? How are we going to take our residents from a period of unconscious incompetence? They don't even know what they don't know, right? I'm not talking about Dick Cheney. I'm talking about, <clears throat> I'm talking about medical knowledge. They don't know what they don't know. And we have to transform them to unconsciously competent, so skilled that they don't even have to think about it. So back to Mary, lights out. It's not as bad as it sounds. I had a headlight, it was on. So I could see just a little bit. The heart-lung machine that I was talking about, well, that can be run actually manually by a hand crank, okay? So we got somebody cranking the machine to keep it going, okay? And we could keep her alive. And what did our team do? We did what we were unconsciously competent to do. We kept operating. And we got to thinking, can we teach people these types of maneuvers, not in the stress and risk of the operating room, but in a classroom? We can take our trainees and do four operations in an afternoon on a pig's heart without putting anybody at risk, without putting anybody in harm's way. Think about this efficiency. Along with a number of other investigators nationally and internationally, we thought we could do this better. Simulation is what we're talking about, and as you know, simulation is rampant in the aviation industry and in many other facets. I bet if I were to take a show of hands, there's a lot of people who have taken a CPR course. That's simulation. Well, why can't we apply simulation to what we do in cardiac surgery training? And we can. We started by writing a curriculum. Now, this is much more important than people give it credit for, and if there are any educators in the room, you already know this. If you don't know what you're going to try to teach and how you're going to assess it and how to communicate it better and allow it to go from person to person without you having to be there for every session, you're not really going to achieve education. You write a curriculum. It works. We apply the concept of cognitive task analysis. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it's a really fancy way of saying we break down the fundamental steps of what we do. So if you've ever taught a child how to tie a shoelace, you have done cognitive task analysis. Every time you have failed using chopsticks, it's because you didn't do your cognitive task analysis. OK? Now, the same thing happens in cardiac surgery. It's just at a little bit more complex level. We have to hold a needle driver. We have to tie knots. We have to close wounds. And then when we start putting all of these things together, maybe you can do a heart transplant one day. So the heart-lung machine that I described that was keeping Mary alive during her operation, it's a complicated series of valves, tubes, pumps. And in fact, in the cardiac surgery operating room, we have a dedicated person, a perfusionist, solely to manage this piece of equipment. This is our takeoff and landing in cardiac surgery. And so one of the things that we tried to do was try to proceduralize this so that we could communicate this better to our trainees, to get them over that learning curve that's so exponentially steep right now. So we took our bypass and wrote it out into 50 steps. And it actually is closer to 250 steps when you put it all down. And each one of these steps probably has another 10 or 20 steps attached to it. But it gives our trainees a foundation so that when they walk in the room, this is not a foreign concept. And they've overcome the first part of their learning curve. We needed a viable beating heart simulator. This is not a human heart as it appears. This is actually a pig's heart that's been attached with balloons so it looks like it's beating. We're putting um, stage blood into it so that if you cut it, it actually bleeds. And we can teach residents how to do cardiopulmonary bypass, heart bypass surgery, valve surgery. And then the really cool part of this is we can turn the lights out. We can teach them in the middle of a routine operation what to do when there's an emergency. And we can take a task 
during one of these events that starts with, that could take five minutes to accomplish and shrink that down to 30 seconds. And when that's you on the table, those minutes really count. So here at Ohio State, I do believe we have the opportunity and the desire to be able to teach our residents in a new way, in a better way. Not only to teach them how to do the routine, but how to react when the lights go out. We can take a period of competency, which was really just immersion and eventually getting there, to one of precision. We can teach our residents how to land a plane on the Hudson. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's music to a provost's ears to hear this, uh, starting with learning outcomes, thinking how you'll assess the success, and then moving to thinking about how that curriculum can be very different from historical. Um, you know, I'm just curious, though, as you talk about this, I mean, you're an accomplished surgeon, you've got lots of ideas about things. Does having this endowed position enable this way of thinking about training and in a way that you would be unable to do without it? Absolutely. Um, one of the, the, the fundamental um, problems about education in the clinical setting, and doctors all over the world struggle with this, is that it's an unfunded mandate. Um, it's impossible to get clinical dollars in order to teach our residents, and especially in a simulation setting where I can't be in the operating room, I have to be in the sim lab with the residents. Uh, and so this absolutely facilitates this and is, has been critical in my last institution and at this institution to allow this to occur. Great. That, I think you see in each of our four speakers the value of this support magnified in such different ways. Let's give Dr. Mokadama a hand. <laughs>